So most uh, welcome everybody uh, to uh, Stockholm School of Economics. Uh, my name is Anders Schneer. I'm a faculty member at the Department of Management and Organization here at the school and also the CEO of our executive education. Uh, and it's a great honor to be in standing in front of you guys. Last time I stood here we had an intense case discussion whether or not banks had um, part of their duties to, uh, to help out concerning global challenges. So we had an intense debate here. So I still, that sort of resonates with me still. And, and I look forward to having that type of, perhaps not exactly that conversation, uh, but actually have a conversation around what is sustainable leadership and, and how do we look upon that. Um, but before doing so, we're going to start with uh, you guys introducing yourself to a person that you don't know already. So it might be turning to the person next to you or turning your way to the person sitting behind you. Just say hello. Wow, this was a crowd. We're going to have such a, a brilliant discussion uh, shortly. But we're, um, so this is why I did this was first to, to see whether or not you are eager to get started, which apparently you are. Um, and then I realized it's going to be different difficult for me to take on the task of when you're going to do a short reflection exercise in a little bit of time and I'll try to, um, we're going to try this. So when I raise my hand and walk like this and I'll say, for those who can hear me, you're going to raise your hand and slowly become quiet. But we're going to test that a little <laughs> bit later. But the important thing, why I did this was, of course, for you guys to get to know each other because that goes back to the mission of the school, to, which was stated back already back in, in when the school was founded back in starting in 1909 uh, with the mission of to increase Sweden's competitiveness and that's what we still rest upon. We want to increase the Sweden's competitiveness and part of that is to network with other people, to learn and be inspired what others have been doing. And that's sort of what we still want to do as of today. We want people to learn from each other. When we bring you into the classroom, you, we have loads of experience in one room and we want to tap that and mix that with academic knowledge and thereby hopefully increase your knowledge as individuals but also help develop your organizations that you are representing. And how we think about this is, is basically some of you that have seen some of our old friends have, have heard this about our pedagogical model which basically are um, a glass or actually three, three glasses like this. In the first glass we put larger stones, basically representing subject matters. It could be around finance, it could be around innovation, marketing, operations, etc. Then we have a literally a second glass which is have slightly smaller stones concerned with global challenges, which could be basically global challenges around water, it could be global challenges around digitalization, so on and so forth. And then we pour it into the first glass, thereby increasing the knowledge density in the in the first glass. Um, and then we have a third glass representing humanities and arts, small sand cones, uh, the importance of reflection, taking a step back, which we often do in our programs. And you pour that into the first glass and thereby we, we furthermore increase the knowledge density in the first glass. And hopefully this is a fairly good drink so we can develop ourselves. We hope. That's our, how we think about it. We want to increase the knowledge density in whatever we do. And when we think about sustainable development and sustainable leadership, what does that mean? And how can we tackle it? Well, I guess there's not just one single answer. That would be a bit too simplistic. Thereby, therefore, we have invited three persons uh, that are going to talk about this from their perspective. So we're going to start with Mats Andersson, uh, former CEO of, of the, um, the fourth uh, pension fund here in Sweden, to tell about how do you manage risks? How do you, how do you select which company you want to select, basically. And then we're going to turn to Robin Tegland, professor here at the school. Uh, some refer to you as Dr. Digital, but basically what has digitalization? And more important so, the role of, of also, Robin's doing quite a lot of work around fintech, uh, Stockholm being a unicorn factory. How does this evolve? What about the network? What about individuals in that network? And then we're going to end with uh, Professor Emma Stenström, uh, coming from uh, this, the research and leading the research center arts, business and culture, ABC. Uh, she, she's going to take it down to the level of the individual. What is the individual responsibility that we're having? And we're going to listen to, have a brief chat from, or brief um, uh, saying from, from each one of these three brilliant people. 
And uh, thereafter, we're going to open up the floor for, for a short reflection and then some questions. And that's the agenda. Um, so with no further ado, I'd like to introduce and Mats. Thank you so much for coming. And first of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Mats Andersson. Uh, as was mentioned, I was CEO of AP4 up until uh, mid-July uh, last year. Uh, and now I'm spending a lot of time being the vice chairman of Global Challenges Foundation, a foundation that is supporting a mandatory program on um, global catastrophic risks here at Handelsskolan, <coughs> which we're proud sponsors of. Uh, I would like to share with you a bit on the journey we did at AP4 in terms of mitigating climate risk as a long-term investor. And then I would like to finish off uh, with a few thoughts on why I believe and I know uh, Sweden is in the forefront of sustainability and why companies are taking this in a commercial way, commercial approach, um, a way forward. Um, at AP4, by law, we're supposed to invest on a 30 to 40 year horizon. Uh, which I read in the law book when I came to AP4. I thought that was impossible. Uh, I thought it was okay to give up returns if you want to be the good citizen. I've come to the conclusion these days that that's not the right way to approach this. The right way is to actually understand that mitigating risks is a way to lower the risk and to enhance your returns, especially when it comes to climate change. Uh, and climate change was brought to my agenda by Lasto Sombatfalvi, the founder of uh, the foundation, uh, Global Challenge Foundation, uh, who kept asking me uh, in 2009 and 2010 about how I defined risk at AP4. And it was pretty obvious to me it was all pending on volatility or based on volatility. However, he kept on asking me and pestering me on questions and said, is that really a risk? Um, and I did rethink and came to the conclusion, risk, in my view, is the risk of a permanent capital loss. Volatility has never killed a pension fund, especially not a pension fund that doesn't have a solvency capital like AP4. So then he kept asking me, how do you mitigate climate change? And I said to Lasla, I don't even know if climate change represents a risk. And then he sent me articles, books, and I came to the point where I said, I think that, and I know that climate change is a risk. And I think we, as a long-term investor, should try to mitigate that. Uh, and instead of inventing the wheel, I went to see 10 of the world's 20 largest pension funds, and I asked them about risk. And they were all telling me the same story about volatility and volatility-based measures. And then I asked them, what about your exposure to climate change? It was as silent as it is now. Nobody had a clue, and this is five years ago. So I had to go back to the office uh, and I spoke to, to, to the head of equities and said, no, Matt, it's impossible. We can't mitigate climate change and it, it's, too, it, it's impossible, more or less. So I asked a young, uh, newly hired guy from, from the university to look into this. And after uh, a year, he came up with the idea to actually lower the carbon footprint in our equity portfolio by taking out the worst polluters in every sector. And by doing that, we got more or less historically the same uh, returns, but we lowered the carbon footprint by 50%. And this strategy worked out pretty well. Uh, so after five years, we were able to actually enhance our returns by 250 basis points, and at the same time lower the carbon footprint in the entire equity portfolio by 30%. I.e., there is no conflict between sustainability and good returns. It's the other way around. If you do this the proper way, it's a way to actually enhance your returns and mitigate a risk. And I'm proud to say that after that we were able to, to were one of four founders uh, of a coalition, PDC, uh, that tried to find the doers among pension funds. Uh, and at the climate meeting 2015 in Paris, we were able to declare that we were 30 members controlling 3.2 trillion US and the management uh, out of 600 billion were put in some kind earmarked for lowering the climate impact in the way you invested. And this was unheard of at that point. And I'm glad to say that even two, two years down the road again, I think that every of the 20 largest pension funds today know that climate change represents a risk that they one way or the other need to mitigate. And I'm sure that those pension funds that tried to mitigate this risk, done th something about it, today can, can uh, realize that it actually has been a driver for returns. 
Then you can ask why is Sweden in the forefront uh, in terms of, of uh, sustainability? And I think the most important uh, reason is all about to do with governance. We know that sustainability is defined as E, S and G. And if you go back 15 years, it all started with a G. The problem at 15 years ago, they didn't know how to deal with the G. So they put it at the end of these three letters instead. But it's, everything starts with governance uh, and ends with governance. Uh, because governance actually represents the toolbox you can use if you want to have an impact as an owner or an investor. And if you look around the world on different governance models, we know that the Swedish model we have is very much owner-driven. It's the owners that represent in a, a nomination committee. You have a very transparent process when you elect people for the board. You don't have the management on the board except for maybe the CEO. This is a very different model if you compare it to US, where in my view, companies are actually being uh, hijacked by management, they elect themselves, they evaluate themselves, and they remunerate themselves. And I think that's a much poorer um, model. So, um, sorry, and here we have the different models. So again, I think that, that governance matters. Um, and I was at the conference in, in Tokyo some, some six years ago, and I spoke about the Swedish governance model, and a guy came up from me from a university in South Korea, and it's that interesting way that you deal with governance in, in, in Sweden. Do you know the owner structure in, in Samsung? I said, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> so, of course, uh, do we know what we own? When, when, uh, Samsung might be a good company, but actually the, we don't know what we own. Uh, so I think that the Swedish way to do it is a better way, and it's all the proof is in the pudding. And my view is this is the outperformance of the Swedish market rolling 10 years. It's been between five and 700 basis points per annum, which academically is impossible. In reality, it's been a great driver for returns for us at AP4. And I prefer to have uh, the Swedish toolbox in terms of governance compared to the US one, and especially to the South Korean one. So again, dealing with sustainability is a driver for good returns. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mats. It's great to be here. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, I am a professor here at the Department of Marketing and Strategy. As mentioned, I came to Sweden in 92. I actually came to work for McKinsey, uh, but really wanted to get back into the world of research. And so somebody said, there's a great school down the street on Sveavegen. Why don't you go check it out? Well, little did I know I'm still here 20 years later, actually 21. <laughs> So there must be something good about this place, right? What is going on here? And this is one of the things that I really wanted to dive into, a little bit what I'll be showing you today, uh, some of our research we've been doing in the Stockholm region. But really, what am I, one of the reasons I wanted to draw on the board is that I am a network researcher. I love to really try to understand how does knowledge, how does different technolo do different technologies, um, reputation, all different types of resources actually flow through networks. And when I talk about networks, I want to talk about informal networks. Who can uh, explain to me how you draw and visualize an informal network? Who wants to give it a shot? I like to interact, you know, engage, right? OK, and if you, nobody says something in a cold call. So uh, who, any, how do you visualize an informal network? Cloud, yes, cloud. a cloud. OK, so some type of cloud here. All right, what's in the cloud? Yeah, how, oh yeah, woo, yeah, way to go, A plus for you. <laughs> okay, all right, how would one visualize an informal, okay, how do you visualize a formal network then, a formal organization? Yeah, a nice hierarchy, right? Yeah, woo, very good. We all know how to draw this, don't we? The formal organization. How would you visualize the informal in the cloud? Who works with these things, with this? A spider net, yes, go ahead. No, I work yeah. With it. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. 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 Probably have nodes and, and relationships. Uh, exactly. Yeah, a node, so a node such as an individual, an organization, a project, a region. Uh, exactly. This, you nodes, and then there's some type of relationship between. And so, what I'm interested in is following these flows, understanding flows to these informal networks, both within, if we can say, the cloud, perhaps the cloud is the organization, but also across boundaries. What's happening with the boundaries of the firm? One of the uh, fundamental questions in strategy is why does the firm exist? Do we need firms? 
We're talking about sustainable leadership, but how long have we had multinational organizations? It's not that long if you think about the long picture, the big picture. And many say that perhaps we're going into the third, perhaps the fourth industrial revolution. What is happening with value creation? What will it look like if we come out on the other side? Will we have firms? What does employment look like? Many of our basic assumptions, especially with this, go back to the first and second industrial revolution. But the question is, will they still hold as perhaps we move into a different era of value creation? I just want you to question these things. We say, oh, we're here. We want sustainable leadership. But what is leadership? Is it leadership of a firm, leadership of a society? What are we talking about? We're talking about leadership. But yes, this is very much so, you know, this informal network. Just a quick question. I, I always like to ask this question. If you're thinking about an organization, what percentage of work gets done through the informal organization? What percentage of work gets done through the formal organization? If you want to divide it up into 0 to 100. 90% informal. informal? OK, that's a lot. That leaves us 10 over here. OK, anybody else? Anybody else want to? Uh... Is it really a zero sum? Okay, that's an interesting question. Yeah, is it really a zero sum? Well, you could say, oh, OK, a little bit of this, a little of this. Maybe we're getting 150%. Maybe it's 70%. Could even be that. It depends on how, what your performance measure is. But if we think about it, if, if we want to say 100% and you want to divide it up, yeah, it's actually research is saying 70 to 80, 70 to 90, you know, 10 to 30. But yet, where do we tend to focus our, you know, where do we tend to focus? What do we focus on? This. And exactly, we just heard this, governance. Yes, it's a very important component. But we often tend to forget this. And this is extremely important. What is happening through these networks? And especially if we're talking about so many firms being knowledge intensive, knowledge based, service based, it's not about creating these, you know, breaking it down, specializing in small unit costs. It works one thing if you're in a traditional manufacturing firm 150 years ago. What about today when we're producing knowledge? Does knowledge follow these flows? It's actually following this. And where does innovation come from? It comes through these informal networks. In fact, 70 to 80 percent of of ideas for new products and services come through informal networks over through the boundaries of the firm. But yet we tend to focus here. So anyway, this was this is kind of an, an introduction to my research. And I, I just a quick question. Since I'm a network researcher, I try to practice what I preach. So I share the more you give, the more you re the receive. So I always talk about you know, what are network principles. And one of them is very much the more you give, the more you share the more you receive in return through such networks. So just one network is a, a formal, in a sense, slide share. Do any of you use slide share? Who uses slide share in the room? Well, I've got a few hands there. What's slide share? Yeah. This is actually a great site for sharing. Steal with pride. If you see something here, steal with pride. No reason to reinvent the wheel, right? And I think this is something we're talking about a fast pace of change. If I sit there with yesterday's knowledge and hold on tight to it, what happens to me tomorrow? Can I use that? It actually becomes quite old in a sense. So if, if you think about it, the more we share, the more we, you know, the more we steal with pride, the faster we can go. No reason to reinvent the wheel. So I share this. So this is actually, you can, if you go here, you can find all of my slides. In fact, some of my courses, I put all the um, presentations out there as well. Uh, we have docu re different reports and so on. This is just one I did a few, year, um, a few months ago. It was about 1,800 views. Uh, so feel free to download and do as you wish. So just a little tool. I like to also enable learning. I think that's what, very much what I like to do. So just uh, really quickly in terms of one of the things that we've been looking at is trying to under stock, understand Stockholm. What's really going on here, especially if I'm taking my perspective of networks. And we've written a few reports. Uh, this is actually, this is, um, this is the executive summary. This report was just launched in May. And trying to dig into this ecosystem. This is the first report of three that's coming. And, and as Anders mentioned, we're looking into the fintech. We have a book coming out in, within about six months, The Traveler's Guide to Fintech. So trying to, what is, what is really going on? Is it a journey or is it a distant destination when we're talking about what's happening in the financial services industry? So we look, took a dive into this Stockholm ecosystem. And really, we looked at it from different perspectives. What is this actual ecosystem? I think one of the things that we find very much is this perspective about Sweden. What is so special about Sweden? And I think it is very much, we do have these hierarchies, but yet we still think it can be very flat, I find. These very flat organizations. When you speak with people from King, is anybody in the room from King? I was speaking with one of the four founders. He said, we have no titles in our organization. What happens if you don't have titles? 
what happens to this? Right? It all of a sudden becomes a different perspective. Now, one of the things that stops knowledge flows, which enable innovation, is boundaries. Boundaries very much stop these flows. And one of these boundaries is very much hierarchical level. If you take this boundary away, that enables knowledge to flow, trust, the, uh, you know, the ability, oh, hey, what do you think about this? So I think this is, this is one thing we found. And I think also in Stockholm, this flat network structure and this, this willingness to share goes very much beyond the firm. And I don't think we realize the importance of our fika and our lunches. There's a study done on uh, Silicon Valley compared to Boston and found very much that the reason for Silicon Valley's success was this informal networking that was going across the boundaries in these local, you know, you know, meeting up after work. We don't really realize the importance. But if 70 to 80% of new ideas of work is getting done through informal networks, then we have to think about where is this actually happening? So I encourage you to actually go. This, I just put this up. This is a Stockholm Tech. Do any of you go to some of these meetups? Try it out. This is where it's so, there's so much happening, bubbling. Think about, you know, one of the things, another network principle is like bon like best. But as somebody has said, like bon like better. So I think that's actually so, you know, what do you say? Birds of a feather flock together. But those, I don't know how you say, different birds, may, I don't know, maybe fly faster. I don't know. But anyway, I'm not how to translate that into English. But I think it's something, you know, diversity enables innovation when we tend to close off our borders to diverse networks, that's when innovation fails. We're talking about sustainable leadership, it's continuous innovation. So it's about connecting boundaries. And this is for everyone in an organization, throughout the organization. This is just looking you know, backward. But if we think about moving forward, what's happening? And I'm very fascinated in new technologies. Um, how many of you have a 3D printer? All right. How many of you own Bitcoin or Ether? OK, all right. Okay. Any, anybody have Ethereum Classic? Cryptocurrency? Ah, just kind of curious. Okay. How many of you have a personal robot? <laughs> Nobody has a personal robot? Huh, I almost brought mine today. I think, I think this is what we're seeing. What many people are talking about is convergence, convergence of trends, where you're combining artificial intelligence with the, with the robots, with the, hard, you know, the hardware and the software convergence, leading to an increased exponential pace or increased pace of change. We don't really know. The challenge, if we're talking about sustainability and leadership, is making the right decisions. But yet, how do we make strategic decisions about the future when we only know what's happened in the past? I heard today somebody was saying that there was a culture that they go into the, into the future walking backwards, looking at the past. But another person said, who actually studies my works research as on scenario thinking, looking into the future, says, the future is something that comes at you. It's not something that you walk into or go into. So how is one prepared? We have no idea what the future will look like in terms of many different technologies and different scenarios. So one of the things I work a lot with is this scenario thinking, scenario. But it's that everybody throughout the organization should be thinking about this. And just to give one little example, I talked about personal robots. I'm actually going to buy one of these now robots. Has anybody seen these? It's fascinating. They play soccer these robots. Go in and, and Google uh, now, now, whoops, this is N-A-O, robot soccer. We have a national team in these robots playing soccer. We have a, a, a captain. Fascinating to watch. These robots are coordinated. They're smart robots. They can actually see where the goal is. They know where to shoot the ball. They see the other players, which ones are the, the opponent. There's a goal that by 2050, the robots will look like physical persons, people, whatever, you know, ourselves in, in terms of strength and so on, but they're going to beat, beat us. So anyway, it's just kind of interesting. Where are, we don't, we have no idea. This is a Frederick, he's a Lufka, and he's one of the leading uh, leaders in this field in terms of thinking about robots and where we're going forward. And this is one of his personal robots, which is actually the world champion in, in what do you say, food, in uh, cuisine, world chef. So, you know, he makes gazpacho that he's taught him how. We have no idea what the future holds. I was lecturing one day for, uh, just not too long ago for Volvo, and they said that one of their suppliers had called up the day before and said, we really need to have a meeting because we need to think about designing buses that have their own, own entrances for robots. We have no idea. How do you make, as a manager, make these decisions or as a leader? And I think this is where if we think about scenario thinking, networks, the future, how does it all come in? And I think this is, for me, if I think about leadership and management, it's about 
you know, th starting over, if we were to take a scratch piece of paper, we look into the future 10, 15 years, think about what are the different needs of society. What will industry look like to solve these needs? Where is our organization in this? Do we have the right competences, resources? What happens if we were to start over? And I think this is very much, for me, the difference between management and leadership, where this is doing all the things right. We're just doing everything, but we're incrementally better. But this is doing the right things. This is actually exploring. And this is very important, getting back to the networks. How do we use our networks? How do we bridge different networks, bridge different boundaries? Because research shows time and time again that those organizations, those individuals, those countries, et cetera, that are more successful at bridging boundaries, that create boundary span, you know, bridges across that are boundary spanners, these are the ones that are more successful. They manage change, they have better, you know, career development, better performance, et cetera. So be thinking about that moving forward. How do you actually use your networks? And I think this comes back to, if we think about, we talk about six degrees of freedom. Well, in our networks, we actually have, this is adapted from collective intelligence. No one knows everything. Everyone owns something. All resources reside in networks. And this is the source of competitive advantage, how we use our networks to gain access to them. And I think this is another thing. It's about access to and not ownership of resources as we move forward. Thank you. And there's also a few. Yeah. I, I forgot to mention, I'm a big surfer. So if anybody wants to surf or stand up paddle, you know, I'm now in your network. So please join me. I'm going to talk about sustainable leadership, of course, but I'm going to talk about it in a little bit different way, I think. But I'm going to try, if I can, relate a little bit to what you've been saying, Robin and Mats, because I think it all relates. Uh, I teach here. I teach the Responsible Leadership course at the Master Program. And I teach our new big, big, uh, not program, but our new addition, our biggest reform of the undergrad program here, Global Challenges, which Mats mentioned very, very briefly. And, and I will talk a little bit about that and, of course, a little bit also about some research because we are all researchers here too. Uh, the way I look at sustainable leadership when I talk about that, when I teach it, uh, is really about integrating different levels. I think for me that is a key word. Uh, it's about integrating and getting like the big picture. And one of the pictures we usually use when we do, maybe it's actually better to take this and I raise it a little bit. Although I like that one, I could use that a little bit more, maybe your picture. Uh, so one of the, the, the pictures we usually use is that we, today we are seeing a lot of challenges. And we do need to manage risks. So how do we do that? And what kind of challenges are we facing? So one way of looking at it that we do is that we're actually facing, of course, challenges we all know about that comes from the environment. We do need to have, if we are talking about sustainable leadership, of course we do need to address the issues about how the planet will survive. That's part of sustainable leadership. We also face issues which is more economical. Huh? How, how, for, for a company, of course, you know, new business models. How do we innovate new business models? How do we find, you know, maybe new ways to create value? So, of course, there's an economical challenge for the world and for us as business people. Uh, we also talk, of course, about the social challenges we have in society, for example, today the divides, the polarization. We're seeing a lot of polarization. How do we overcome that? That's a challenge for a long-term survival as well. And then we talk about the, I put a heart there, the existential challenges. What will happen with work in the future? Huh? Maybe we'll create lots of new work. Maybe we'll have other ways of actually organizing society than we know. 
that of course raises a lot of questions about meaning and purpose and why do we do what we do? So existential challenges as well. And this of course is you know, taken from lots of different perspectives. World Economic Forum, the fourth industrial revolution is one way of looking, adding the existential challenges. This is more, you know, maybe more common in economics using these kind of challenges. But addressing all that, that's also part of sustainable leadership. Because if we are to survive as a planet, as a society, as an organization, and as individuals, we do need to address them. So we address them these days. We start with doing that the very first day when the students arrive here at the business school, which is fairly new. It started this fall. But how can you use the tools? How can you use business administration? How can you use economics? And of course, integrate that with other disciplines, natural sciences, social sciences, humanities, arts, to better address and solve these issues. And we talk about it on different levels. We talk about it, of course, on an individual level, the human being. We talk about it on an organizational level. We talk about it, and I should add networks. I was thinking about that when you were talking there. But usually we say society, but of course networks. It could, you know, worth thinking about. Adding knowledge to each other too. And of course the planet. So addressing those issues on all these four le levels is really part of sustainable leadership. Uh, and, and one way we think about that is that perhaps we cannot address issues about the environment, for example, or social divides if we don't address issues with our own kind of sustainable well-being. How do we sustain as leaders? How do our groups sustain? How do our organizations sustain? So it's really about taking the, all those perspectives, all those levels, and also thinking about our own part in it. And of course, there are lots of, you know, it's a lot of fantastic development in the world, but there are also some worries, I would say. And of course, one of the things we need to address too, we think, in research and teaching is also how do we actually create well-being? How do we thrive? And the networks are fantastic. It's wonderful. It's wonderful to cross boundaries. It's, it's beautiful. I love it myself. But sometimes it's a bit difficult too to work in very new ways to handle boundaries. Where are my boundaries? So that becomes another part, of course, of it. Sustaining ourselves. And of course, when, you know, we teach young people here at the SSE, and the numbers there worry me. Where we see a lot of stress, a lot of issues among, especially among young women. And of course, needing to address those issues and needing to address it in the organizations too. So one way we address it is through uh, what we call compassion. And that sounds very sometimes not so Swedish, I would say. Um, the way we look at it, I work in, in a, a research program together with Karolinska Institute, the medical school. Uh, it's become very popular to work with compassion. So what is compassion? How do we address that? Uh, well, the way we look at it is compassion, of course, for the world, for our organizations, for our groups, but also for ourselves. We look at it in the research, we, will, we look at it in different kind of organizations. We look at it on a level where we look at the culture in the organization. Can we create a compassionate culture? But we also look at it on an individual level by working with compassion training. Once again, together with the medical doctors, psychologists in this kind of interdisciplinary teams. Can we also address it on a personal level. Uh, so one model we use, I give you one more model because it's always nice with this kind of model. One model we use is taken from a, a British uh, researcher called Paul Gilbert. Uh, 
he works with a very simple one about, he talks about our three systems. Um, and then the soothing system. As human beings, you know, we have three major systems, emotion regulation, really. One is threat. We all know that. Threat, which is, of course, is really important. Because if we didn't have that system, if we didn't get that adrenaline, if we didn't get that cortisol, we wouldn't be able to jump if a bus arrived or lion is what you usually use, but that doesn't happen so often. So we need a threat system, of course, to react. And then we have the drive system, the excitement of going after new ideas, of raising the kind of level of dopamine, really exciting. You know? This is what, it, you know, achievements. A lot of organizations, I would say, that I encounter, and a lot of my students that I encounter, are pretty much into that system. Perhaps more than the threat, more into the kind of drive, drive. Which is fantastic, again, we need that. But how do we also balance? The whole idea about this kind of research is really about how do we also balance that system with something more soothing, with actually creating security, because that's also needed in a, to be able to address those big issues about sustainability or networking or finding all these exciting ideas. How do we balance that? How do we also create the soothing in organizations, in cultures, but also in human beings? So some of the things we will do when we do that kind of research and also in the classes here, of course, is about, okay, so how do you take care of yourself? Robin mentioned the surfing. You know? Probably a way to balance all your slide sharing, knowledge, all the energy, the need to balance. And we all have different ways. But how do we actually address that? And how do we see that? And how can we help people in organizations addressing that? And one of the things, you know, we see, we, we go in with six week in the, the research project we're doing, we go with a six week training. And right now we've been comparing one big bank with a public agency. And well, we've done like a six week training with people in the bank and in the public agency of compassion training, where self-compassion is one part. Like really just sometimes very, very simple things. Taking care of yourself, but of course also of each other also of using compassion for those big issues and for the organizations, your colleagues, and sometimes even your boss. So that's also sustainable leadership, addressing that level as well. Well, thank you, Emma. I'm going to open the floor. Do we have any, we have a spectacular three people in front here. Do we have any questions or thoughts or reflections that you'd like to share? Here I, I, I can start since I started the cloud thing. And I'm, I'm a business lawyer, so I see things traditionally more in boxes than clouds. But, but I think we were just discussing that. I think in my head and my world, the, both the cloud and the boxes has always, have always been there. Mm -hmm. And the focus has been on the boxes, and now the focus is on the cloud. But I don't think the cloud could exist in a large group, for instance, without the boxes. So my question would then be, are you trying to get away from all boxes, or is it just it's whether a, they are the It's a great question. Well, I'd like to uh, comment on, uh, can an organization exist without boxes? Well, what about open source communities? Where did Bitcoin come from? It actually came completely out of this, and it still is. Very much this kind of fluid network, emergent organization. It's worth about $30 billion today, and, and yeah, Bitcoin's out there. Uh, this is something that has just appeared. So if you think about open source networks, open source communities, which is really what I focus on, there is very much this cloud. Now, having said that, you don't necessarily have this formal box structure, but yet some type of informal hierarchy does emerge where you do have people, but it's like being a, a, a leader of a guild in World of Warcraft, 
right? You have to earn your leadership, you, and you can be thrown out immediately by the network, depending upon how you behave within this network. So I think there's, I, I agree, we've always had both. You need both, and I was thinking about it also in terms of Matsu's point of the governance, because I think the governance sets very much the tone of how, what's going on within the cloud, and how does the cloud act, in a way. That there is, you have, you do have this sum spell, where you say that this, uh, how do you say that, this, in, yeah, collab, you know, the one reflects the other, this interaction between going back and forth. I don't think we're trying to get away from the boxes. Uh, I think some organizations are. Um, but some are not, and that we, we don't know. What will the future look like? And I think there'll be much more heterogeneity, many more. It's not a black or a white, much more gray zone. Uh, there's a company called Automatic. I don't know if anybody knows of that. It's 540 people across the world where the employees in 54 countries, they have no head office and no email. So everything just goes, is all fluid. And you can go and work wherever you want, and f full parent paid parental leave. And you get a coffee allowance, by the way, or a co-working allowance. But they do meet once a year for the face-to-face, -face, building the relationships, because trust is very important, right, in networks, within networks. And I think that's where you, when it talks about the half-life of trust, you know, you get a big injection of trust, and as time goes by, trust declines, and you need perhaps another injection. So I think that's what they think, but you need to create a rhythm of this trust, of these trust injections. So, I mean, it's time will tell. So that was my, yeah, long answer for it. Did, I, did you want to say anything? Okay. Good question. Sorry, was it on the same topic? Do you think that agile organizations are a way of transitioning towards mm -hmm. more of this informal way of work or more yeah. agile? Yeah, I. I think, I think that is a good example. All this type of, you know, agile, you know, it's very much this kind of rapid kind of prototyping in a way, a rapid, you know, this, and this immediate interaction, not waiting, nothing, it's like life in beta. I think it's also about that nothing is ever finalized, I think. So how, you know, just continuous, you know, improvement, but also thinking, you know, within the networks, but just, you know, moving on short, but this brief interactions to improve. So I think, yes, that's one transition. I think there are many transitions that we don't even know. I mean, if you think about the percentage of the workforce that's in this gig economy, you know, we've used to, there's now we even have a new term. Before we had independent contractors and employees, now you have dependent contractors. So those who are, you know, very, de they're self-employed, uh, working for, dependent upon one organization, so potentially or Uber or whatever. But I still think now you have so many different options. Where do I want, how do I want to, you know, or say, um, for sure to myself, how do I want to uh, make a living? Right, so uh, there's many different opportunities now to that. So I, I can keep going. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I mean, this is, don't, yeah. <laughs> Maybe somebody else wants to comment. Yeah. No, and I, I think it's not, it's not a replacement. I think we, it's a complement, exactly. Yeah. And to what degree, how is one complementing? But I would also say that we, we're, if we're in a transition phase, yes, perhaps today we still need this formal, but perhaps moving forward, do we still need that? We don't even know how blockchain uh, might enable things, how different artificial intelligence might enable things. I mean, there's a lot of things converging that we don't know how that will influence organizations and formal organizational structures. So I think it depends, you know, what is what is a transition? We have no idea. So, but I think it's... Hmm. Question from Yeah. Um, great question. <coughs> Next question. <laughs> Let's go. It, of course, it differs a lot, uh, but I mean, if, if I look back on the on the past ten years, what's happened in in the pension industry, long term investing industry, uh, it's a huge difference. Uh, and regardless where you are, I think that most pension funds today see ESG as a way to actually enhance your returns. And if you have a long-term uh, view on, on things you do, um, you need to be sustainable, otherwise you will not be successful. 
Um, and I'm, the, the problem with the industry is that you are usually evaluated on a yearly basis, but your mandate, the duration of a pension fund is probably on, on the li liability side 30 to 40 years. And this is a total disalignment between the pensioner and, and those running the money. Um, but we're gradually get, getting there, and I think that, that, again, coming to Sweden, I think we have a longer-term view. I mean, according to the law, an AP fund is supposed to invest on a 30 to 40-year horizon because we're supposed to be neutral in between generations. So, again, but then you need the toolbox. You need the governance model to actually be able to implement whatever you want to do. And on a global basis, um, I, I think we, we, we lack today a toolbox that can actually address the global catastrophic risks we have climate, uh, nuclear weapon, and, and pandemics, whatever it is. And that's why the, the, the foundation that I'm in, involved with, the Global Challenge Foundation, has launched the, this uh, new, new Shape Prize. So, so governance uh, is where it starts and ends. Max, uh, uh, interesting with the written return, but don't you feel that you let the world down by letting these uh, polluters go? Uh, that's a question I, I get not now and then. And I would say that's why in, in Sweden, uh, AP4 actually took the role of being an active uh, owner, and, and we were on 27 nomination committees, etc. But how do you engage with Exxon as uh, AP4? Please let me know. I think the only way, given where we are in terms of size, is actually to let them go. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm a believer in engagement, but I mean, if you don't have, if we go to AGM in US, we're not even allowed to vote on who's going to be on the board. Can you imagine that? Well, I'm sure if you gang up, there will be some people in an informal network that could fix that for you. And I'll tell you, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> you, need to, you, need to, you need to have a, another strategy on, on that. But I think that, again, it, it, it shows the, the importance of governance. I mean, you should not be able to have informal networks. If you're an owner, you should have a vote on who's going to be on the board. That's a big question, and I think uh, it's a very relevant question. How are we enabling those who are, will be displaced? Because you can be displaced overnight, potentially. Uh, how will we enable those to, re to learn to improve their skills? And actually, if you look in the U.S., there was just a report saying they were talking about, you know, projecting forward that, yes, on the one hand, you have, you know, you, there's, there's, there's certain, you know, we, we don't have enough labor out there. We need to hire more people, but that you have a bunch of people who don't have the right skills. So how do we enable the skills? And I think there, there is definitely possibilities if you think about how much we can learn online now. Um, if we think about all the MOOCs, the massively open online courses, you can go to YouTube. You can, so I think it's up to both organizations as well as societies and poli you know, politicians to actually enable this learning, to learn to learn. But also enabling, you know, small, medium enterprises. One thing I'm going to uh, Washington later this, if we think this month, you know, looking at what, what's going on over there and how there's so much focus on large organizations. What about the small, medium enterprises? What about, you know, enabling individuals to start on their own? And I think that's where we, if I, if I, one of the things I try to get Sweden to think about is, you know, getting a free mobile uh, broadband everywhere. And opening up, enabling people to create networks, to learn, 
Say I want to be work for myself, but and I I've got a great I can make fantastic glasses. I have the ability to sell that any in the anywhere in the world, if I have access to the internet. There's access to money through crowdfunding, so there's a lot of possibilities. But it's about enabling these people to find those possibilities, and I think that's where it's a well the responsibility lies in every, in everyone. And it, well, yeah, I think this is a big a big challenge. And the thing the thing that uh, that kind of worries me is very much when talks about social cascades. That if we're talking about networks, I think this is something we're seeing. I mean, we, people have been working in networks for, for you know, studying them, thinking about how social media has come along, predicting what would be happening with these different platforms, such as Facebook, et cetera, where you create these closed circles. I think these companies have a tremendous responsibility. Google and Facebook, what are their algorithms, you know, feeding us? What are they filtering out and enabling us to see? So, and what happens if you, you know, the more you close the circle, the more you reinforce your opinions. So if you get this group who are so disenfranchised or, dis, you know, upset, then it becomes even stronger. So how do we ensure, enable that these actually, they're bridging out beyond? And I think that's where these companies also play a major role, both in terms of learning. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons why they're going very much forward for trying to enable the world to bring up internet access to 100%, because where it's about 40% now. So how can we enable this? So that was, yeah. I don't know if you want to. Yeah. All right. I think this has been a great conversation. Uh, there was a great buzz uh, when we just finished, and we're going to continue that conversation. Uh, we're going to move it a little bit outside. These people will be around if you want to go more into engage with, the, with them. Uh, otherwise, feel free to engage with each other, share knowledge, uh, because that's what we're here to do, to share and learn and thereby help ourselves and help our organization but with and we'd like to th say a big thank you to these guys by a uh, spring flower this wonderful day and a warm hand thank you to you and thank you to these guys